uh, in, in, with these technical problems. But we have uh, in 2002, basically, uh, they, they, there were uh, this, the discovery of these retinal ganglion cells that are in, in intrinsically photosensitive. These are the IPRGCs. So IPRGCs, as any other ganglion cells, receive inputs from rods and cones uh, through intermediate retinal cells. These, uh, so, but they are unique uh, in the way that they have this photopigment, they express this photopigment that is melanopsin. And uh, melanopsin is different from opsins of cones and also from rhodopsin, since it, uh, since the peak wavelength of this photopigment is around 460 or 480 nanometers. So in 2005, Dennis Daisy, uh, Dennis Daisy uh, characterized uh, the IPRGCs in primates. So since then, we know that less than the 2% of the total retinal ganglion cells are IPRGCs. They have the largest dendritic tree. The major concentration of these cells is in the paraphobia. There are no dendrites in the fovea. Their dendrites are placed in the inner and outer borders of the inner plexiform layer. And there are two independent populations. Uh, actually, now one more was uh, reported in, the, in, the, in a paper in, of 2019. Uh, they received inputs from amacrine and bipolar cells. So projections of IPRGCs are to different brain centers. And now we are interested in one that is the olivary protectal nucleus, which is a brain center to control the pupil light reflex. So the first um, report of the projections to, from IPRGCs to the olivary protectal nucleus was in 2002. And since, since then, the number of publications uh, related to the pupillary light reflex or pupil light reflex increased uh, through all these years. So just to remember, the pupil uh, has, uh, when you turn on a light, the pupil contracts. And uh, in 2007, Paul Gamling and colleagues uh, demonstrated that there are surprising similarities between the IPRGC's uh, response dynamics and the pupillary response dynamics. And this evidence were accumulated throughout these years and uh, the, the, this, the, this, the evidence of the direct relationship, relationship sorry, between IPRGC's response and the pupillary response. Several properties of IPRGC's uh, may be inferred from another non-image visual function. Uh, the pupillary light reflex was also recognized uh, recently. So as you know, I am an engineer. So to tackle this question that how do IPRGCs work, I tried an engineering approach together with Dr. Dean Kaikau. So we can um, just uh, model the uh, IPRGC as a system that has an input that is the light simulation and an output that is the cell response. And we can uh, monitor this output with the pupil Larry uh, light response. We can uh, do a systematic modification of the simulation attributes, that is the frequency, intensity, baseline, and the type of inputs in isolation or in combination. So one of the questions that is very important actually for in the engineering uh, in, in, the, in the engineering field uh, about system is that if the systems are linear or not. So from mission science, 
sciences, we know that analysis of the visual system leads to the surprising conclusion that linearity is a rare and apparently priced commodity in neural signal process processing. Uh, however, the evidence suggests that the linearity is preserved along some pathways all the way, all the way throughout the retina. So the IPRGC system could be treated as a communication system. Therefore, we analyze the linearity of the system to control the people life reflex using mathematical tools. So instead of previous um, studies using a pulse to, to elicit the pupil life reflex, we use uh, the flickering, uh, a flickering stimulation, but actually not a, a, not a square wave stimulation, but a sine wave stimulation. This is because we use it a Fourier transformation in order to analyze the response in the frequency domain. So if the response is a pure sinusoidal, which should have just one uh, component at the frequency of the stimulation. But uh, we, our results are, we, you don't have only that uh, component, but also other components. But using this approach, we can analyze the amplitude and the phase of the uh, pupil light response to flickering stimulation. So we systematically um, change the different attributes of the stimulation while we did uh, experiments changing the frequency response, the contrast response, the light level response, and also the summation response. Uh, we did also the phase paradigm and the bit paradigm in the summation uh, experiment. However, we have an input type challenge. In the human retina has five photoreceptors, the three types of cones, rods, and also the melanops melanopsin photoresponse. These photoreceptors have overlapping operational range. And to study isolated and combined photoreceptor contribution, we need to find a way to manipulate independently each photoreceptor excitation. I'm going to explain a little bit how is the silent substitution that is the technique to uh, produce independent X stimulation uh, to each photoreceptor type. So let's suppose that we have two types of photoreceptors, P1 and P2, and we have two lights uh, with different intensity. IB in, is a short wavelength light and IR is a monochromatic longer wavelength uh, light. They produce a different, they produce a responses in both photoreceptors uh, that here are called R1 and R2. If in a second time we increase the intensity of the one of the lights, in this case IB, we will have, of course, a, an increment in the response of photoreceptor one, but also an increment of the photoreceptor two. Um, but if in this same time, we decrease the intensity of the photoreceptor, uh, sorry, we decrease the intensity of the second wave of the second light, the light with the longer wavelength, the, responses of the photoreceptor one will decrease, but also will decrease the response of the photoreceptor two. And we can manipulate the, the, this uh, variation in intensity in order to produce um, a variation also in the response of the photoreceptor one, but to keep uh, fix the stimulation of the photoreceptor two. And so in this case, using this technique, we can produce a variation in one of the photoreceptors while, while we can so we, we silence the other photoreceptor. We can extrapolate this to the other uh, photoreceptors, but in this case, we will need more primaries. And we apply this technique using a color dome 
uh, a color dome system. This is a commercial system, but it has only four photoreceptors. Then we uh, we built other system that is called the five primary photo simulator, which uh, allowed us uh, with these five uh, primaries, allowed us to use the silent substitution or to apply the silent substitution in uh, the five photoreceptors. With this technique, we can produce uh, different uh, conditions of a stimulation. For example, the isolated a simulation in which we produce this, uh, we can uh, produce a variation in the excitation of one of the photoreceptors while we maintain fixed the excitation of the other photoreceptors. Also, we uh, produce an simulation in which, which is the combined uh, simulation where we maintain fixed the, uh, the stimulation phase of one of the photoreceptors while we change the phase of the other photoreceptor. This is called the phase paradigm. So we can plot the amplitude and the phase uh, of the responses in a polar plot in order to analyze uh, how is the uh, linear summation prediction? So let's suppose, so in a polar plot, uh, the, the amplitude will be given by the length of this vector and the phase will be given by, by the angle of the vector. So let's suppose uh, if we have a summation, a linear summation of cones and rods and we change the phase of the cones with respect to the phase of the, of the rods. So a linear summation prediction will give us these uh, values of amplitude and these values of phase uh, to a 45 degrees uh, cone phase. If we increase the cone phase, the IPRGC output and also the pupillary light reflex uh, the pupillary light response will give us this amplitude and this phase. And then we can try this one for other, uh, for, other di for different uh, phases. So this is the prediction of a linear summation of two photoreceptor excitations. Of course, we can do this, uh, or we can also try other type of predictions. For example, a summation that is out of phase and a summation in which there is a winner takes all uh, combination. We ran in 2014 together with Dr. Kao, this experiment uh, in which we changed the phase of the connex of the cone excitation with respect to the phase of the rods. And this is the data, uh, this is the data for four different light levels. This is the pupil amplitude and the pupil phase. And we can see that the, that the data fits nicely the prediction, actually the prediction fits nicely the data for this uh, experiment. And this is the, the linear prediction. And we can do the same with other combinations. For example, when we change the melanopsin phase with respect to the LMS cones, uh, combine it in phase. And also with respect uh, when we combine melanopsin with S cones, and when we combine melanopsin with L over L plus M cones. These two last ones are for testing in the KC pathway, which codifies um, blue yellow information and the PC pathway, which codifies red green information. So in this case, we have that the, pre the linear summation uh, predicts the MC pathway uh, combination, also the KC pathway combination, but not the combination of melanopsin and the PC pathway which is better predicted by the winner takes all combination. Prediction, sorry. 
other way to to assess the linearity of the of the system is changing the contrast we can do this uh, or we did this in the combination in the pc in the sorry in the kc pathway first we change the contrast of the melanopsin and see how is the amplitude and the phase of this uh, of the of this response and we obtain that when you increase the melanopsin contrast we have an you have uh, we have an increment in the melanopsin in the amplitude of the response and when you change the melanopsin contrast also there is uh, no so much difference in the phases in the scones we also uh, with increasing the contrast of the scones the amplitude increase but the phase is around 180 degrees this is something that we actually was um, uh, discovered previously or was reported actually previously by Manuel Spitchen in 2014. We can also try uh, an approach combining one uh, contrast of melanopsin, in this case 4%, and the combination with contrast of S cones at uh, different levels. So in this case, uh, we have this uh, pattern of response, and this can be also predicted by the, by the linear summation. We can see here how. So since S cones are out of phase uh, from melanopsin, IPA in, in the cases where the S cone contrast is uh, low, the response of the IPRGCs is better explained by melanopsin, which is uh, which is which are these points in the responses. But when you increase the S con contrast, now the response is lower. For example, this case. If we increase more the S con contrast. Now the response is better explained by the s cones uh, response. So this is other way, uh, yeah, other way uh, to test uh, the linear summation prediction. So to answer this question, if this system is linear, uh, we obtain these conclusions. IPRGCs combines linearly rods and cons contributions in the mesopic range to control the pupil light response. Melanopsin combines linearly with the MC pathway and with the KC pathway. The PC pathway interacts with melanopsin in a winner-takes-all fashion. How about nonlinearities? Well, we can test nonlinearities um, in the pupillary light um, system when we uh, try, for example, a simulation of two different frequencies, for example, these two simulation, uh, these two sinusoidal stimulation will have uh, two, these two uh, responses, F1 and F2. And if the system is linear, uh, the response uh, should be also uh, just uh, will have in the frequency domain, sorry, you will have uh, two responses in the in these frequencies, two components in, in those frequencies. However, if the system is no linear, there is other component that is the bit response that is actually the difference of the frequency two respect to the frequency one. So. Uh, we did uh, this is first of all we did the, the, the frequency we obtained the frequency response of rods and cones in isolated condition but also combine it and for different uh, for a range from 0 0.5 to 8 hertz and these are for two light levels in the mesopic range 
Uh, so basically, this is, this is something that we know that in higher frequencies, the response decreases. But we run uh, this experiment uh, using four, the four, from four to nine hertz in order to see how is the bit responses that should be lower than that. So we tested two uh, pair conditions that is four hertz and five hertz. The other pair condition is eight hertz and nine hertz. And for different uh, same photoreceptor types or cross photoreceptor types. We did find a, a bit response for one condition that is the combination of four hertz and five hertz. Uh, however, uh, this response uh, was not, uh, we didn't see this response in other conditions. For example, when we combined uh, frequencies of eight hertz and nine hertz, and also we didn't find responses for the cross photoreceptor type, just for the same photoreceptor type. Something interesting about these results are that the phases of the bit responses are uh, basically 90 degrees away from the phases of a single um, of a response just for a single frequency stimulation. And this, uh, this difference can be accounted for a rectification process in the, in the system. So the conclusions for this uh, second study is that the bit responses were substantial at the same photoreceptor condition, but not for cross photoreceptor condition, suggesting that nonlinearities occur before rod and cone signal interacts. Individual differences are important in retinal nonlinearities to elicit bit response. Nonlinearities were consistent with the rectification process. How are the light adaptation characteristics of IPRGC mediated pupillary responses? We were interested in to understand how the background luminance adaptation hurts uh, an effect on, uh, on the response. And we, from vision size, we know that the background adaptation um, have uh, has an effect on contrast attraction and also brightness. And in a part of this range of the background luminance, uh, this adaptation process can be accounted for the Weber's law, which is a variation of the simulation needed to produce a change in perception, uh, which is proportional actually to the background intensity. So the adaptation characteristic of isolated photoreceptor mediated pupillary responses were assessed uh, and we test the effect of background adapting light level of flickering responses. We did this um, for a stimuli condition uh, for isolated LMS, R and I, um, I, which is the melanopsin photoresponse. And we also tested the luminance uh, condition, which is L plus M plus S for comparison purpose. These are the results for five different uh, background luminance from 0.3 to 4.3 log Trolland uh, levels. And these are the amplitude and the phase results of the pupillary flickering light responses for cones, LMS, rods, and melanopsin in this column and in this other column for M cone, L cone, S cones, and also LMS uh, for comparison. So we can see that here uh, many uh, overall, all of the conditions, uh, the amplitude increase with the light level, but the phase is uh, basically the same across the different light levels. And of course, the S cones are out of phase uh, from the other photoreceptors. 
if we try this, uh, if we model the data with this equation, uh, we see that the exponent actually a is lower than one when, but if we have a Weber's uh, characteristic, it should be around one. So in these cases, we don't have the Weber's law uh, doesn't hold. We also tested combinations of these um, of these isolated conditions, and basically, we have the same uh, response of the same pattern in the adaptation trend. So the conclusion of this third uh, experiment are that neither of, of the photoreceptor mediated pupillary light responses show light adaptation similar to vision attributes such as contrast threshold and brightness. And also that melanopsy mediated responses show differential weaker light adaptation characteristics compared, compared with cones. Other question that we have is that uh, which cell type provides information to the IPRGCs? So we know that there are three post-receptoral pathways, the magnocellular pathway, the parvocellular pathway, and the coniocellular pathway. The magnocellular codifies luminance information, and it's... Um, and the cells involved in these pathways are the paraf parasol ganglion cells, but also uh, diffuse bipolar cells, uh, off and on, on and off diffuse bipolar cells. For the parvocellular pathways, the cells involved at midjet uh, ganglion cells and also midjet bipolar cells. And for the coniocellular pathways, the cells involved are as small as the stratified cells and also as cones by polar cells. But we didn't know at that time uh, which cells uh, were uh, involved in the um, sending signals actually from rotten cones to the uh, IPRGCs. From our experiments, we find that, of course, uh, besides the you know, the, com the first har harmonics components, well, you have other components in the, in the frequency domain. And especially there is this uh, second harmonic component that was present in some conditions. And we saw that this second component uh, was more important uh, for this condition, for the L over L plus some conditions with respect to the other uh, stimulation conditions. And from physiological studies, uh, actually from this work of Lee and Sun in 2009, we know that diffuse bipolar cells in the MC pathway show a strong frequency doubling responses to threat green modulation. And this is the signature of the MC pathway. So from this, uh, so actually we, we see well from these results, we have that uh, we can conclude that the frequency doubling characteristic of the L over L plus M condition provides evidence of a role of diffuse bipolar cells in the pupil control. So the conclusions of this, uh, these studies are that IPRGCs combines linearly thoughts and cons contributions in the mesopic range to control the pupil light response. Melanopsin uh, also combines linearly with the MC pathway and with the KC pathway. The PC pathway interacts with melanopsin in a winner takes all fashion. Uh, the nonlinearities uh, in the pupil light reflex were consistent with the rectification process, which is uh, basically um, into the of uh, previous to the combination of rod and con responses. 
Also that melanopsin-mediated PP light responses show weaker light adaptation characteristics compared with the cons PP light responses. Um, last but not least, the frequency doubling characteristic of the L over L plus M condition provides evidence of a role of diffuse bipolar cells in the pupil control. So to discuss a little bit these results, there are some similarities, but also some discrepancies with other, other works, other studies. For example, Do and Joe in 2013 showed that IPRGC's light adapt following weber fertner's law. But according to our result, this adaptation characteristic might be modified in the efferent pupillaris human system. Uh, also, reports on MCOM mediated PP response. They, there are actually two studies, one from Walders and the other from Murray and colleagues in 2019, show that response to the MCOM stimuli is out of phase. Uh, than LCON and also than melanopsin response, but in phase with SCON responses. Uh, the, discre the discrepancies with our results might be explained but from, different, from the different approach involved in those studies with respect to our, to our, to our studies. But uh, we think that further work needs to be conducted to understand this discrepancy. Uh, also, uh, an electron microscopy study by Liao, Liao and colleagues provided direct evidence that diffuse bipolar cells are involved in excitatory inputs to IPRGCs. This is uh, actually in agreement with our findings. Well, that's all. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the people from the Visual Perception Lab in Chicago, uh, especially to Dr. Jin Kaikao, and to the Visual Neuroscience Lab in Tucumán, and all the people from the Institute of Research in Light, Environment, and Vision. Also, I want to acknowledge uh, the institutions and all the funding agencies uh, that support my research. Uh, well, thank you very much, and apologies for the hesitation in the beginning. <laughs>